Um, Titus is about to tell the students how to fill out an incomplete. And so go for it, Titus. Okay, so first you go on my lion, you log into my lion. And then once you get on there, you click on students. And then after that, you click on student forms. You have to scroll down a bit. It's gonna be on the left side of your screen. No, but mine, it's at the top. It's right next to IT. And then once you get there, you scroll down, it's gonna be at the bottom right corner. It's gonna be request for an incomplete grade. You and once you click on that, it'll just take you to fill out the, the information. And once you finish completing all that, you just click generate document. And after that, I believe you email it to the registrar. No, I think you the have to, the provost. To, to me, you have to mail it oh. to me and I have to sign it. Yep, that's right. Well, let's I, see. Yep, I it think, does require your signature. I know how to do that, though. So I didn't always know, but I, I think I can handle it. <laughs> and I think it has to be done by... I don't know. It would be good if you did it by today, but of course that's five o'clock is past. So tomorrow sometime, uh, you really need to fill it out. Um, Professor Beck? Yes? Uh, do you have the course name and the course number? RPH 140, World Philosophies, but I, I don't want you to be sending this. You know, I don't want you to be filling it out during class here, okay? Okay. Um, okay, so is this it? This is all we're gonna have? Um, so, you know, we did the online video and I told you we would do one round with, I told you you only had to read two articles and that you probably would prefer not you know, you can do the Levin, the atheist mathematician, if you like. But um, I thought we'd start with this one, then we'll do this one, and then we'll do this one. Um, and then I did ask you to talk about what you, oh yeah, the four different stages of religious life, if you wanna do that. But mostly what is it you, you anticipate that you're going to write your world philosophies um, final paper about which things stuck out to you. Um, is there anything else that I said on the video that anybody remembers? That I is that the or is that what I said I was going to do? <laughs> um, all right, so let's start with the Einstein. Who wrote on Einstein? Okay, Michael, go ahead. Okay, so I, um, one of the points I wanted to talk about was um, when uh, in, in the chapter they was talking about a passage from Albert Einstein's audio biography, and it was him talking about um, like why we spontaneously wonder about things. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, he said that, um, I think that wondering to oneself occurs when an experience conflicts with our fixed ways of seeing the world. Um, and I felt like that was a pretty, um, like, I felt like that was pretty uh, uh, significant in like, you know, us talking about having like uh, in intellectual conversations with each other about like varying uh, different viewpoints. Um, and so that I thought that was, uh, I thought that was interesting to look at uh, within like conversation today, uh, when you look at, um, you know, when you're talking about politics, for example. Um, yeah, so that was one of the, one of the points. So if it's polarized, nobody wonders why somebody thinks on the other side, right? They don't even ask, they just, oh, because they're a blah, blah, right? right? Okay, so I do think 
I don't, I don't know why people don't want to wonder, you know, why do people vote that way? And just ask them just out of total curiosity, because, you know, if there's something I'm not getting, right? If there's something I'm missing, um, I don't know. I, I do wonder about these things, but okay, go ahead, Michael. Uh, well, that was like my first, that was like my first point for the. Anybody else want to comment on that? Um, I have another comment on the article itself. Because... Go ahead, Titus. Okay, so the quote I looked at was near the end, I believe it was one of the conclusions where they were talking about when they said we were, we are not the center of the universe, that we're just, they said we have emerged, meaning we are part of it. And it's kind of funny because it reminded me of a quote from a movie I watched. A doctor in that movie said, I think it was human's biggest mistake is thinking that we are in control of nature instead of the other way around basically meaning that we are self-centered and because of that we become ignorant to what's really going on and what we can actually can control and I guess the best example of this is climate change and it really how can I say this it kind of makes us seem like hypocrites in a way because we see, we say that we can control it, but we do nothing about it. We leave that to nature, saying that nature will take care of it. So it kind of don't make sense to say we can do something, but none. Let's let nature do it. I just found that and that quote kind of hypocritical in the way we interpret it nowadays. Okay, or say you love God and you destroy the creation. Basically. <laughs> or God will take care of it. I don't know. <laughs> Doesn't work for me, but. Who else commented or read the Einstein that you'd want to comment or ask? Go ahead, Caitlin. Um, so I. I wrote down a quote, it was, um, the universe is not only given rise to life, it's not only given rise to mind, it's given rise to thinking beings who can comprehend the universe. And I kind of like when I looked at that one, I just kind of liked it because it seemed kind of like, not really controversial, but I feel like there's some things like when it says comprehending the universe, like maybe that's something that we like don't necessarily need to do when we have like I may have just taken this to like kind of a side thought but like rather than like comprehending the universe we need to be able to like take care of what we have first I know that's kind of a side note to the quote just kind of a random thought that I had but like what's what's the point of comprehending the universe if we are destroying what we have so yeah, I do, I do resent it when people say, well, we don't know for sure. And it's just kind of, well, we should act on what we do know, right? That's intellectually honest, right? It's intellectually dishonest to say, oh, uh, there's all this black matter, you know, it might come and clean up the carbon for us or something, right? Yeah, I, I agree with you, Caitlin. It, this is, why are you just escaping the fact that here's what we know and it will take a whole lifetime to just restructure our societies to act on what we know right Caitlin yeah yeah anybody else <laughs> we should do shout outs for each other now <laughs> I wish you been doing that before um Anything else on Einstein, that article about Einstein? Akaya, did you read it or want to comment at all on it? 
Well, I've read it, but I commented on the other one. Right. But um, any comment you want to make right now on something you read? Um, no, ma'am. Nothing was surprising or reminded you of what we already did or like I roll, we have to go through this again. <laughs> mm -hmm. I know there was something that stuck out to me, but I didn't write it down just for the simple fact that I commented on the other article. Okay, Trey, did you read it, Trey? Uh, ooh, my mic was okay. kind of a little bit, uh, kind of going with uh, what Caitlin said about um, having a natural login to understand like what God was thinking. And it kind of like, so it talked about, uh, it said, we are supposed to try to understand and with an understanding, we should realize that we are now destroying the natural order that had immersed in the, the biosphere. It was just kind of like going along with Caitlin said. So, I mean, I didn't really like understand it. I was still kind of like trying to understand it, but maybe you can help me out or something like that about that part. So um, FYI, 50 years ago, more than 50, I, I was a told, you know, explained uh, some biology professors explained the process and we really needed to stop um, environmental destruction. At that time, it was just uh, a lot of stuff. It was the erosion, it was water pollution, air pollution. Um, they didn't talk about climate change because that's the one that's the most complex the most difficult to predict in a precise way, and it's not visible, right? Especially 52 years ago. So they would talk about something more concrete, like erosion, you can see it, right? Or water, whatever. But the corporations, Exxon, these other guys, it's all documented, I can send you the documents. They decided that the best way to control the narrative is to reduce every environmental problem to climate change, right? And then he said, they literally said, sell doubt, the way you would sell a commercial product, right? Doubt, you know, but are you sure? But no, no, you know, and it was things like, um, the prediction originally was that the atmosphere would get warmer faster than it has. And they go, oh, oh, you see? But the, the oceans were absorbing the heat. That's where it was going. And so then we're gonna kill all the fish and all the coral, right? And so, you know, it's not like, it's not gonna happen. There's nature is nature and it's gonna find this way, but when you keep throwing this crap into it, it's gonna to have to figure out how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. So that is a matter of fact that doubt was sold as a commercial product. And of course, my students at Lion would sold it. They sold the good, you know, they bought the goods from the corporations, you know, oh, but doubt, oh, but it's not precise. And, you know, I don't know, I didn't used to speak up on it, but I mean, it's so obvious now. Um, and I'll tell you the irony or the craziness. Okay, so when I was 18, 16, I knew this. My daughter works for Rainforest Alliance, which is an organization that's trying to do sustainable products. Like that's her whole thing. And she told me, I'm not supposed to talk to her son about climate change because in their circles, everybody knows and it's creating all this anxiety with little kids, right? So, so look at that gap between me at age 16 and where I am now as a grandma. I can't even talk to my grandkids well, not, I mean, no, the point is their whole lives are going to be completely messed up by climate change. But that's, that's kind of the historical record. And that's why I don't think I'd be doing you a service at all 
by by not talking about it, right? It's just like you've had this dumped on you. I'm sorry, and I'm really sorry. Yeah, there was no need for this, but to have anybody still denying it is crazy. Um, I don't know. I even have a clip in a related issue about Asa Hutchinson trying to get our Kansans to get vaccines. Uh, <laughs> anybody who wants to see that, uh, you'll have to email me on that one. But um, anyway, so that's another problem, right? Um, Arkansas is really getting, I think they have more people in the hospital now than they had a year ago. So that's, that's kind of worrisome. Um, so I, I mean, I'm sure we're going to have class on campus, but we're probably going to go into a masks and, a, you know, COVID tests regularly. We'll probably do what we were doing before um, last semester. So just FYI, be ready for it. Um, and then the other thing <clears throat> I did talk about was Einstein, the tragedy of Einstein's life? And um, did, did you listen to that? Did you guys listen to the video? Who listened to the video? Because I mean, I just need a context here. Okay. <laughs> well, I just talked about how Einstein's life was tragic. And I, I hope you have time to listen because it really is interesting. Um, he grew up during the enlightenment before World War I. He was a Jewish kid in a Catholic school in Bern, Switzerland. It was all interfaith. It was science is going to save the world. There was no question, right? And then he ends up a Jew in Germany, and he has to hightail it out of there But before World War II. He's a pacifist. He can't stand war. And um, he gets to the U.S., and it's because of him discovering relativity. It's because of that paradigm shift in how to look at the universe. It's because of that, that they developed the nuclear bomb. And he's a pacifist, okay? And so he has to go to the US. He gets asked if he will participate in the Manhattan Project, which he did, because otherwise Germany would get the bomb. So he ends up, because of his discovery, helping to create a nuclear weapon to kill the people that were going to kill all the Jews, right? And think of how far that was from where he started in his life, right? And um, the good intentions of science, right? Science was going to, it had such good intentions and they end up with the nuclear weapon. So if you, you know, if you want to use him as, as an example of just how far your life might be 50 years from now from where it is now, right? And how good intentions, right, aren't good enough. And just to try and get you to realize, you know, we're all historical creatures. And um, you do need to know sort of historical context for the things that you're going to run into so that you can be the change agents, right? Or the path makers or the ones who don't overreact right? There really is going to be an incredible need for people who, who keep their heads straight, who have what the Greeks called sophrosune, which is level-headedness. <laughs> okay, so um, what about the, the next one, the poking horn? And Dyson was um, complementary nature of science and religion based on um, quantum mechanics. So Akaya, what have you got? So um, I had talked about um, that like God doesn't know the future and he's not the puppet master of the universe, like pulling every string. And I feel like that, like I feel the complete opposite. Um, I feel like he knows like how our lives are going to end up and then I said, like, he will allow us to be successful or whatever, as long as you're bringing that 50% to the table. And, like, the the choices that we make, like, some of the bad choices that we make, it's not necessarily God. It's us. Like, you have 
the acts of the flesh and then you have the fruits of the spirit in the bible it talks about that in galatians 5 and 19 and so i just feel like yeah god isn't making every decision for us but um he is allowing us to live our own lives and he i I also do feel like he doesn't want our lives to just be super perfect of course he i feel like he wants us to make mistakes but he will be there for us like whenever times are hard and then for my other point, it said, um, it talked about how God can't create a creature with free will and then control that creature's free will. And I just feel like everyone was born with free will, but like there were just people who took it upon themselves to create like governments and laws and policies in order to, I guess, regulate our nation. Um, and me personally, I just feel like some of these things that we have now we could have, you know, lived without, but I feel like some of this stuff goes back to greed and how people want to be big and they want to be noticed, so. So do you think governments came to be because people were arrogant and trying to play God, or do you think they came to be because people were arrogant and greedy and you needed rules? to prevent them? Yeah, I feel more like we needed, like, rules and stuff like that but okay yeah so so in the name of god and wanting to make sure everyone flourishes you would start a government and have rules um well i i feel like that is like it helps but it also hinders because some um some laws and policies like are, I don't know how to explain it. They're well, not some laws. Remember, we went through the virtues, right? Knowing mm-hmm. how to create good laws. So sometimes the laws help the rich. Sometimes it's because the lawmakers are incompetent. Sometimes it's because they're basically being employed by the rich to make laws. <laughs> that's corrupt. Um, so that's why. Um, you just have to keep being a good citizen and staying informed, right? Um, so yeah, so the best answer to that is sometimes this, sometimes that, right? It depends upon the context. And that's good because I think saying government good, government bad is is dumb, <laughs> right? As soon as somebody says government good, some wicked person, can start using it for their purposes, right? As soon as you say government bad, um, the rich can take over, right? So yeah. Um, Oh, what about suffering that's going to come from climate change? What do you think is the, the relationship between God and humans? If, for example, you know, your house blows down from a hurricane, which is a lot worse because of climate change. Right? A lot of people are going to suffer a lot because of climate change. So what would you say in terms of the relationship between God and humanity in those cases? So like, what what are you like, I don't know if I'm understanding the question that you're... Well, okay. God will allow us to be successful if you bring your 50%. Well, what if you're not successful because um, because the business you were going to work with got uh, flooded out, you know, from uh, floods that are were worse because, right? Just something... Um, that we make efforts and we try to do stuff and there's obstacles, right? And some of those are caused by other wicked people. Some of them are caused by our own vices. Some of them are caused by natural disasters. Some of those disasters are because of climate change. Some of them are, remember the tsunami? It said in that article that God, tsunamis are part well, um, the what? 
the way that earthquakes are a part of the natural world. But just because somebody happens to live where there is one doesn't mean God was out to get you, right? Okay, so, so what do you do when you are, you know, working hard and you're doing everything you should do and you're giving back and um, something happens where it all falls apart? And it seems like God isn't there for us, right? Jesus on the cross said, my God, my God, why, you know, why have you forsaken me, right? <laughs> But anyway, so how would you process that? Well, me being like very, very religious, we always like in church, we would talk about like, um, yeah, your life might be going good. And then all of a sudden something bad happens. And my pastor, he would just say like, maybe that's God. Um, like maybe he's just, may, I don't know, like, Maybe he's putting it in your life because maybe that time isn't the right time for you or something like that. I don't know. I can't really explain. Okay, it. I'm just thinking, you know, that whole chart about suffering would be you could go and check out like what what are the causes that God gave you the ability to figure out with your brain, right? Does that make sense? I mean, you can figure out all these causes that are just related to the, the way God created us, right, in the universe. So, exa for example, you get sick. You know, that isn't necessarily a plan. That's just because God created us the way we did, we get sick sometimes, right? That isn't necessarily specifically targeted at you. Um, but other things, I mean, I've had events in my life that just seems like, oh my God, there must have been a God that came in and plucked me out of this situation. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, even if I don't even believe in that, I will never forget it and I'll never stop being grateful for it, right? So people who even don't believe in a personal God can acknowledge times in their life where absolutely, if there is one, I'm so grateful, right? Um, so but on the other hand if you the trouble is if you get too too much into god intervenes at various times it's really hard to explain some stuff that happens to people right some people just really suffer unjustly a lot and so to be able you know to tell them that somehow this is god's plan seems to me just it's a little too anti anti intellectual like you can figure out causes other than that does that make sense akaya but it is tricky it's not easy anyway go ahead oh i was just saying that how like what all you were saying makes sense and i never really just thought of it that way because mm -hmm. i was always just like when we were in church i would always just be taught one thing and so my mind wasn't open to thinking of thinking of it in that sense well you know what you could do akaya on your final paper if you want to just think of all the things that your preacher said over the years that you remember or that really helped you whatever and then go to that chart on unjust suffering right and just see which ones right you can actually figure out were caused that's not anti-God, right? God created us this way. And, you know, the Stoics, the Stoics think there's God, there's a universe, it's ordered, but, and there is a God in us, right? It's just that within that context, you can figure out a whole lot of cause effect connections so that you know, so that you can prevent problems, right? That's one thing. You prevent getting into situations and then you can know that some things are accidental, some things are that, and also people hurt other people, right? That's a major source of suffering is relationship issues. And God created us to depend on each other, to love each other, but we also hurt each other, right? And so, I don't know, if you wanted to start sorting that stuff out in your head, you might wanna write your paper on that. Um, and yeah, I, 
I ran into a lot of obstacles and I used to ask myself these questions a lot. It wasn't that I, I didn't think God was out to get me or anything. I just thought, oh, this is because of sexism. And you probably want to sort that out, Akaya, because you think sex and racism. So this is because of sexism, right? It's not God. This is because of racism. That's not God. This is because of classism, you know? I wasn't born with a silver spoon. That's not God, right? Does that make sense, Akaya? So that you, you start figuring out, you know, this that you're at this point where all these things converge. And, um, but you should always be grateful and all that, you know, and humble, all those traditional virtues are fine. Go ahead. So like, I know the other day, um, McKesney was talking about like, um, believing in God and there not being a heaven as to like, you are not believing in God and there is a heaven. And so, like, you're talking about all, like, the things that are happening, like, sexism and racism, and it also makes me question, like, um, like, if God is, like, real, then why is he allowing, like, all of these super bad, unjust things to happen? Because I know I just said, like, maybe it's not, like, the right time for them, but I feel like God wouldn't allow somebody to go through, like, racism or sexism or anything so it's just like why is he why is this happening that's what's in that article right mm -hmm. if you create a creature with free will you can't control what they do with their will does that make sense Akaya? and the other thing is that we are we do depend on each other and that's where love comes from we love each other but it would be would it be better we hurt each other too right would it be better if we we're all just machines which you know some people are trying to make us extensions of the machine. Don't depend on other people. Just go to go to work and do your job and be a good computer nerd. And you know, is that so most people though wouldn't give up, wouldn't trade, not depending on people at all, versus depending on them, loving them, and getting hurt by them. Does that make sense? But that isn't God either. That's us. <laughs> abuses of free will but anyway if you want to sort that out and use excerpts from that article or whatever and that that's always good i've had a, a number of students write a lot of really good papers one kid that wrote one of the best his mother died of cancer when he was in high school and people said to him it's god's will <laughs> oh that was you know he wrote a really good paper <laughs> And um, because he understood, he'd been through all that reasoning before. So anyway, good, Akaya, that's great. Um, who else wants to comment on that second article? Anybody? I'll comment on it because I am pretty sure I took from the same quote she did, which sucks oh. since we talked so long about it. But I kind of took it from the, I guess, experience standpoint point when they say well when I don't even want to try pronouncing this last name but he said I think God allows creatures to be themselves and also also not talking him not being a string puppet master and they say he does it out of love so I was kind of thinking especially when we were talking about climate change that maybe this is all a part of his plan, meaning we have to experience what would happen if we don't take action, because obviously we have the knowledge to take action, but choosing not to, but maybe we need to go through this experience to learn how to prevent it from next time, which is kind of what I was saying, talking about yesterday about experience being hopefully the last resort, but since no one is taking action, we're kind of getting to this last resort of experience because no one is listening and obviously no one is acting. So we kind of have no choice. Well, in this case, there's no next time, you know? I mean, there's empires that rise and fall and stuff, but this is like, this is permanent. It's not in the realm of human choice. Human choice, you know, like, the, an empire can 
choose to to not admit that it's declining and bomb the, the tar out of everybody and decline anyway and learn its lesson and life goes on. But in this case, life isn't going to go on. So yeah, I also had a question about that. Now, I don't I have no idea what the Bible says specifically, but I remember hearing something about the Bible saying that the world was going to end in fire or something like that. <laughs> so I don't that's know. Right. That's I mean, that's where, kind of sus to me. That's that's right. That's when you split reason from faith. You can justify anything. Right. You're right. And so, yeah, no, this class is about religion when it's tied to reason and God when it's tied to reason, right? Um, but no, no, there's going to be more and more people saying, oh, it's the end times. We don't have to do anything. It's God's plan. Um, I don't know about that, but. Yeah, but I mean, Lion, will, Lion College philosophy, uh, Foundation isn't going to accept that, right? Because it's the union of reason and faith. So it isn't just about me. It's any position that unites reason and faith is not going to accept that, right? But it will be. It will become more and more popular, actually. Um, okay, who wants to comment on this second article, Michael? Um. So one of the things, uh, and I can't. I kind of brought that up. Was that um kind of like the idea of like why, why like why bad things also happen you know and it touches on it in the article within the aspect that like um we like we were given like free will to do these good things and these good things made even better things you know and then it talks about how you have the other side I think they meant, mentioned it as like the shadow side um and how we you know there's it, and it actually in one in one aspect not one portion of it, it talked about like bacteria and how they they mutated and they led to you know they led to life you know they led to you led to life in a good way and then it had talked about how you know they also mutated in other ways and that led to cancer for example um and i felt like that was kind of reminiscent of the the idea of um kind of like the idea of means that we talked about towards you know more at the beginning of class um and how it's a, it's a sort of balance, I guess. Um, so that was one of the things that I, that I looked at. Okay. Yeah, the capacity for good always brings with it the capacity for evil, right? But, um, Caitlin, did you have a reaction to this article? Uh, yeah, I have a quote. Um, it's God did something more clever. He created a world with independence, a world able to make itself. Creation is an ongoing act, um, one in which the laws of nature make room for choice and action, both human and divine. And I think that one kind of continues with the like um, good and bad things happening. Like, because it says, I like how it says creation is an ongoing act. And like God created a world that was able to like build on itself. And so like we have all these things that we've created and all these things that we've learned. And um, I don't know, I just thought it was interesting. And like the ongoing act is like, I feel like that's implying that we're supposed to like continue building rather than just like saying, oh, it's the end of the world. No, <laughs> we're supposed to keep creating and keep building on what God gave us in the Anybody want to comment on that? Yeah, I agree with that because if you wanted us to just sit here and be like the world is over, then we probably wouldn't have any knowledge on how to fix this. But just the mere fact that we have knowledge and information just lets me know that he probably does want us to use that knowledge and move forward and progress. Okay, so we can do something. If we can, we probably ought to, right? Um, okay, so the, the idea there is that you inherit things from your ancestors, right? 
and you've inherited some good things and some bad things. And then you pass on to your children. Um, so yeah, our relation to the natural world is one, the racism, right? The sexism, the um, class split. Those are things you've inherited uh, for better or worse, what your elders have done or not done. And then you figure out, okay, what do I want? What do I personally want to work on? What do I want my generation to work on? Um, and then the other thing is that it applies to you personally, right? You're, you should always be building and keep creating, right? So if you mess up, you, you don't quit. Being passive is, the, the word there is pathos. And the Greek word is pathos. It's where you get pathological. It just means passive. And then you, you don't do anything or then you react, right? And then the alternative to that is eros, where you create, right? You're creating something out of a passion, a positive love of something, right? Love of justice or love of nature or love of uh, another person would cause you to create a marriage. You literally have to create a marriage. It just doesn't sit there, right? It's an active history. You're making a history. Um, same with your family. It's a very creative act, not just to have a kid, but to create a family, right? Create a family system, weaving it together. Um, so anyway, eros, pathos, and then the other choice is violence, thanatos, where you destroy things. Um, so we, we do have choices about that. Um, Trey, did you, did you read this article on poking horn and Dyson? Uh, not really, no, no. Okay. Is there anybody I didn't call on yet? Okay. So let me just go over the outlines for a second. Um, because they do bring up all the themes. Yeah. Um, so let me just ask you for a second. How many of you plan on looking at the video? Because I, you know, I might as well not say stuff. Um, you mean your pre-class video? Yeah. Okay. If you plan on, uh, it's an hour and 10 minutes and I don't want to bother you, right? <laughs> if um, you plan because I did summarize the class and I just thought I'd wrap it up. Um, but, you know, the thing that Genesis is not intended to be taken literally, that's an old theme we've covered in this class. Um, I hope you can understand how everything in these quotes really do weave together with what we've done in the class before. Um, I didn't intend it that way, right? I bought this book just for my own interest, obviously be interested in the topic. And then I go, oh, I should put this, you know, in my class. Um, poetry is supposed to educate your heart, whereas science doesn't, it's the detached observer. So you really need both of them. Um, you can tell that these physicists are in love with the universe, right? They aren't detached observers, they're lovers. <laughs> they love studying this. They think it's natural, right, to wonder about it and take pleasure in learning about it. Um, then they also uh, appreciate this, the mystics, the saints and the mystics. Why? Because they have that intuition, they have wisdom, they exercise the virtues. Um, so yeah, quarks are like uh, particles and waves. They're analogous to Jesus being both human and divine. I think that's, you know, that's interesting. And um, let's see, God works through nature. Prayer is not magic. Um, so in the video, again, I said, literally, again, if to pray, if you pray by say, trying to envision, trying to 
plug in your eros and envision a better you or a better move forward. And then you get insights from prayer. You get insights or you at least can take the burden off so that you don't have a grudge and you don't take revenge, right? Avoiding the Thanatos reaction. Hopefully prayer would uh, break you out of the pathos, right? You feel overwhelmed and help you create a vision moving forward. And that whole idea of you're forgiven, right? You repent, you forgive. It's trying to break, break out of negative patterns. But if prayer is really doing deals with God or, um, you know, some people to me, what they think God wants just happens to be what they want. So you have to make sure your idea of God isn't just your own ego. <laughs> so, you know, you can say prayer is, is a good thing, but it really matters who's praying and what they're praying about. <laughs> uh, humans have agency. Um, illness is affected by personality. Um, okay, so, so it, is, it is trying to distinguish between what it is that are the natural order that we cannot control and change or the, the forces like gravity and electromagnetism and all that. And then the realm of human culture, which we can change quite a bit. So, um, all right, problem of suffering. So Akaya, if you wanted to go over that in your final paper, you can do that. I mean, I, I, really, I really enjoy reading those papers. Um, Oops, just a sec. Um, oops, I don't know. All right, why isn't this, I don't know. Why isn't this arrow moving? I don't know. All right, I can't seem to get, oh, stop the share, okay. Now, back to, Okay, I don't know why I can't get out of this one into another document on the, this class. Sometimes you can just click to the left of the like the right. What? Paper. Click to the left of the paper, just the area. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I've never seen that before where the arrow doesn't come up. But anyway, okay. And then on this one, the points I wanted to make. Yeah, we naturally desire to understand. When you're writing your final paper, and I'll ask you, you know, what ideas you have about it, do you want to name it something, right? Spiritual humanism or spirit or you know, humanistic Christianity, or or do you want no labels, right? That you don't want to have a label because a label is a box, right? Um, as soon as you label yourself, you're going to have to start making distinctions, right? When you say, I'm a humanist Christian, you say, okay, by Christian, I don't mean this kind of Christian or this kind, right? Um, and by humanist, I don't mean this kind of humanist or this kind of, so um, if you just want to say what you mean, or you make up your own label, right? I used to have students do that. And just you know, make up a couple words that really articulate what you think. I've never, I made up the, the expression spiritual humanism um, because I couldn't find it anywhere. And now I find out, yeah, there are other people who use that word, but, um, or if you just don't want to label. Um, so, and why? We have a natural desire to understand. Nature finds, nature is always seeking higher and higher levels of perfection within a context of patterns and limitations, uh, limiting forces. And we do that in our lives too, right? Well, what are my options? And what, which option do I think would move me forward the most? And there's all these things I can't control. 
Like I have to take a stupid RPH class before I can get my degree from Lyon. <laughs> I can't control that, so what can I do? Um, okay, there was a time when Einstein thought that quantum physics meant that God plays dice and that the universe is completely random. And he was very upset about it. But then the quantum physicists say, no, that's not what it means. That's just a different kind of pattern. You have to look in a different place. Then this one is that actually Einstein brought back uh, notions of time and space that were ancient notions and more organic. And that's true of Aristotle. He, his, Aristotle's view of time and place and space is the same as Einstein's. Um, let's see. Um, okay, so. All right, I don't know. Um, okay, Levin. This one is, she's a mathematician and um, an atheist who questions whether we have free will. And this is interesting. I want you to follow this with me, okay? Follow this line of reasoning because it's a good example of how really smart people can lose their common sense <laughs> because they get too uh, specialized, all right? So she's an atheist who questions free will because mathematics, you know, it just looks like everything is determined. Um, she cleaves to the face of this, okay, she cleaves more fiercely in the face of this belief, determinism, to the reality of her love of her children and her hopes and dreams for her children, right? Um, okay, so you could be a determinist and say, you know, that I have this instinctual love for my children. And that's determined, right? That's biological. Um, but the trouble with that is there are women who really, for some reason, right, don't have that reaction. And, the, you know, you have to pity the poor kid, but they could be corrupted. Maybe they're drug addicts or something. Um, so, so, you know, that's problematic. It isn't necessarily determined because not every human being necessarily um, does that. So there's so many things in human affairs where even our instinctual drives, which to some extent are determined, right? We have pleasure and fear. But right after that, something like the love of your children is problematic. I mean, people can have life experiences and live in cultures and whatever where they actually get conditioned out of it. Um, well, I guess another example is uh, people have female babies and they bury them alive, right? Because they know that that this this kid is going to have to be provided for and. Um, won't provide for anything and you're going to have to have a dowry. Whereas if you have a boy, he'll take care of you, right? And you can get the, the daughter's dowry, his wife's dowry. So, I mean, people can be conditioned out of it. Um, so uh, that seemed a bit odd to me for her to say that. Um, what do we know and what don't we know? Uh, she says, I don't have to convince you of mathematical truths. They're cut and dried. Um, but, uh, um, okay, so she has a sense of meaning and purpose that doesn't, you know, that's her sense of meaning and purpose. Math doesn't either deny God or prove God, but she's an atheist, right? She chooses to think it's good enough as it is, which is fine. You know, I think you could decide to live a virtuous life on the classical view and call yourself an atheist. That's fine. I don't care what you call yourself. Um, but somehow for her, this is important. I think the reason why she decides she's an atheist is because she has this idea 
of a personal God who intervenes in things. So the things that she knows are necessarily true are denied and that. And so, she, okay, I'm going to, I don't agree with that. So I'm going to call myself an atheist. Um, now, this is, um, here's another issue. She says our minds are based on neural structures. Um, so we have to figure out when, when she's doing math to study the universe, she's literally wiring her brain so that the neural structures in her brain correspond to what mathematicians know about the universe, which is nice. Um, she says, my feeling for my children has evolved, but it's still meaningful. I don't care if it came from, uh, from God or you know, just evolution. But she says, where does she say? Oh yeah, this is it. The things that are completely constructed by human beings are uninteresting to me, such as legal systems. Well, the thing about it is she has kids. And it, to me, anybody with kids, the things constructed by your society, like the legal systems, the educational systems, the healthcare systems, should matter a lot to you because your children can't flourish unless your society has a good set of socially constructed systems. So those systems need to be designed to promote flourishing. And so it is amazing to me that she would always, she would talk about how much she cares about her kids, but she's completely disinterested in legal systems, social systems, political systems, educational systems. And uh, I think it shows that she's over-specialized. It also shows that she lives in an affluent society where she just assumes her children are gonna be safe and educated and have healthcare. And she doesn't realize, you know, that she's got a lot of skin in the game for preserving that. And just like the Athenians didn't think they would ever lose their democracy. Um, so I, I thought that was pretty surprising. To me, you can say these uh, socially constructed systems uh, are really important to me because I want them to be just. I want them to be constructed in a way that promotes flourishing, but I don't have time to actually get engaged with the process, but I do take it seriously. I try to be a well, an informed citizen, but to, for her to say it's uninteresting just kind of really is a shocker to me. And it sort of shows how out of touch intellectuals can get. Whereas this class tries to combine, right? Personal virtues and vices, social, political, and then our relationship to the biosphere and then our relationship to the universe in general. So um, I just, I try to, um, to say that they're all connected. We don't have time. None of us has time to, um, study to to take them all seriously and get really good at all of them but they're all there and they're all important um now does anybody have a reaction to to what i said about the mathematician what she said anybody want to take a stab titus what do you think Mm, let's see. It's hard for me to think of something at the moment other than, I guess, it's hard to think of something that I haven't already said constantly. Yeah, okay. True. I mean, just the very fact that the issues keep coming up is kind of interesting. Does that make sense to you, Titus? Yes, ma'am. And they don't seem to think. Oh yeah, everybody, you know, this comes up, you know, they don't, they, each of them, you feel that each of them has gotten there totally on their own, thinking that they have original ideas, which is <laughs> like, eh. All right. <laughs> okay. It's all about learning your history. 
Okay, Michael, go ahead. Um, this is because I was I also read this like part of the book. Uh, and at one point, um, Levin says, um, I do, 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 sorry. Uh, and if I try to look at that closely, I would say that things totally constructed by human beings, I have a hard time taking seriously. Um, and I think that they're talking about um, like how um, uh, things that are like basically things that are like structured and important to some to mo many like different humans that like that that Levin those things aren't really important to her her Levin her yes um, and I just felt like that was almost like a contradicting statement because I feel like the majority of things in life are constructed by human beings you know what I mean the majority I feel like the majority of things in our lives are constructed by us and so I felt like that was almost a contradicting statement to just like I don't know well how is it that she got her education right as a woman somebody had to construct an educational system and let women participate equally and construct a legal system where it's illegal not to hire a woman if she's qualified. I mean, just think of all the things she depended on to get where she is, right? Right. And so, yes, that's just to say we are social and political creatures. So we need all these constructions, but we also, they also have a natural foundation that they're accountable to. So if they're sexist, they're wrong and they're unjust, right? So just because it's constructed doesn't mean everything's relative. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you can't say, oh, well, sexism is okay in this country and not that country. No, you know, it's always been wrong. It's just that for lots of reasons, societies didn't get around to really focusing on it. One of the main reasons was until really recently, maybe 70 years ago, most people spent most of their lives having kids and keeping them alive and then dying, right? And leaving a few healthy kids. That was really most of our energy. And it simply is not anymore. Whether you like it or not, you know, you're going to live 80 years, you're going to have a couple kids and spend maybe. 15 of those years actually taking care of them and then what are you going to do twiddle your thumbs or what right you got to get a job you got to <laughs> so we really have to expand but in order to to flourish we have a chance to flourish more than ever we need good social systems right right michael socially constructed stuff it needs to be well constructed or people are going to really get mad <laughs> which they do uh caitlin did you have a reaction at all um i didn't read it but um like one of the very first things you said about um how her like she was over specialized i think that's something that really like kills a lot of different like aspects of like life like it made me think of um like in sports, like if you're over specialized, like it's better to play like multiple sports. True. And so That's it just kind of, true. it just made me think of that. So. Oh yeah, Plato's Republic talks about that, that the the athletes got so specialized they weren't even really that healthy. They had to yeah. go on this regimen, and if they got off of it, it's just like. <laughs> yeah, I totally forgot about that, but I do remember talking about that too. <laughs> That, that is interesting, Caitlin. And also, like, they aren't necessarily good at thinking about political things or, you know, anything. They're just, all they think about is their athletic performance, you know? Yeah, very interesting. Okay, somebody else. Nobody? Akaya, anybody have a comment? Um, all right, so we have one more round, um, and that is, what do you think you, you're going to write on your final paper? Uh, what comes to mind? 
right? It might end up that you'll change your mind and it'll be totally different, but where are you going to start, right? Um, go ahead, Titus. Mm, I have a rough idea, I guess. I guess I'm going to write it over the things that I know I've been saying constantly throughout this entire month. I guess if I were to come up with a title off the back, it would be called the number one rule. And you y'all could probably guess what rule I'm referring to because of what I've been talking about the entire class. But I guess I'm just going to go religion by religion, kind of comparing them all to prove in, in the end, they're all kind of pointing towards the same direction of that golden rule. So in a way, it, I don't want to say it doesn't, no religion matters, but so long as you follow the positives of what that religion is trying to teach, then you should be fine, no matter what afterlife you're thinking of. I highly doubt any religion that people believe in thinks they're going to be punished for not doing the nitty gritty of that religion. Even atheists, I highly doubt they're going to get punished if they're good people. They're treating people the way they want to be treated. I feel like even they will be rewarded in the afterlife. So I guess that would be my, that's my rough idea of what I'm going to write. Yeah, actually, I, you know, I think about how do students picture, you know, the judgment day, right? What if you're an atheist and you are totally virtuous? Is there, is this God going to say, you didn't kiss up to me, you know, you didn't kiss my dairy or you didn't build a big church so that, you know, we want those mega churches. <laughs> like, what kind of God is this? <laughs> I mean, I just don't understand it. And then the other person who is really power and money, but, but, oh, you know, I brought 300 people to you, God is like, huh? <laughs> Who are you? You know, you didn't people decide for themselves. So uh, you know, you you tried to manipulate and abuse, and you're really trying to make yourself into God. And um, I don't believe that, right? The whole idea is that people decide. Nobody gets, you know, strong armed into it. It just makes them insecure. So um, yeah, I don't you don't get brownie points for thinking that you controlled someone's free will because I don't even control someone's free will, buddy. <laughs> and it's actually supposed to be the complete opposite of controlling people's free will. <laughs> I don't know. Again, I'm just like throwing that out there, guys, because I'm a philosopher and I don't get some of this stuff. And I also, I honestly think students haven't thought it through that much when they're still 18 or whatever. Uh, some students haven't really thought, now oh, what does this really mean? Or that somebody is really not pure in heart, but they faked it. And then they go, you know, as if God is going to be fooled <laughs> or mocked or whatever. I don't know. Uh, it, um, beats me. Um, all right. So, Akaya, what do you think you might write on just now? Well, I'm definitely going to talk about the suffering and then like God versus like the human race and free will, abuses of free will. I'm also going to like compare, like you said, like sexism, racism, civil rights, women's rights, human rights, Black Lives Matter, and like religions all together. But like as far as a title for my paper, I'm definitely not sure about what I'm going to call it, but I'm definitely going to like base my paper around like suffering and God in the human race okay i mean you could just call it akaya august 2021 here i stand or something like that you know i don't it works for me um because i hope that you will change your mind someday right but you don't know if you change your mind unless you make up your mind or you know you have a mind right you gotta start somewhere um and hopefully if you look back a year, two, three, four, and read it, you know, so many students get out of college. Oh, thank God. 
and then they get some job, some mind numbing job, and they go back and read their college papers and go, gee, I used to be smart. I used to think, you know? <laughs> and so uh, hopefully when you look back, you'll go, oh, I think in a way that's way more complex than that now, right? So hopefully you'll keep growing. That's, that's the goal. Um, Caitlin, what about you? Um, so my paper's pretty much already done. Um, and I kind of read out like, I kind of like first, like summarized, I kind of like took my first worldview and took some of those points that we had talked about in class. I talked about, uh, different philosophers and their ideas. I talked about opinions of mine that I had before the class that have changed or been like more solidified through like teachings from philosophers. And I talked about, um, feminism and Black Lives Matter and then Martin Luther King. And I still have a little bit to add, but that's kind of like, it's kind of like just a summary of all the things that kind of just like, I think will stick with me for longer than just the length of this class. So I feel like I really learned a lot and I had a lot to say. Yeah, well, you did have a lot to say. So on this video, I do go through, I scroll back down and I go through all this, each theme from each class so that you can see how I tried to organize it to weave it together. So if some of you are looking for inspiration, you might want to follow, follow that and just see if somewhere along the way a button goes off. Um, and then Titus, I was going to say, do you think there should be some sort of golden rule in relation to the natural world? Um, so it could be. Um, you should treat it in a way that you would want your children, right? I mean, you can think of it just in terms of passing on the heritage to the next generation, right? It, by saying, I'm not happy that my parents, you know, dumped this pile of you know what on me, and they wouldn't have wanted their parents to do that to them, right? You can do it that way, or you can do it just having some kind of empathy with plants and animals, like being brutal toward animals, you know, it doesn't technically violate the golden rule, but I wouldn't really want other people to be brutal toward animals, right? Does that make sense? Yes, and definitely one of the, one of the quotes I'm planning on putting in my paper, it, it was something I talked about, I don't know how long ago, but it was how I dislike those people who basically went for the went by the phrase do as I say and not as I do because they're basically doing what they want and expecting the next generation to fix what they've messed up so and that's not how it should be especially when you are capable of fixing stuff on your own so your next generation can have better lives and even improve upon what you've laid the foundation on. The other thing to note, you know, it's very important is the golden rule is what reason is. So human reason is that ability to universalize things. So it is really a cornerstone of what it means to have reason. So it wouldn't make sense that on any view of what God gave us or God made us, it would include reason. Do you remember Mar Mary Wollstonecraft says, you can't say that people are gonna go to heaven or hell based on controlling their impulses and then not giving them reason. <laughs> what kind of God is that? Ah, these women are all gonna roast, you know? So just the notion that, that the golden rule is what reason is, right? Um, and then also you can apply that in certain ways to our relationship to the natural world, yeah. Um, okay, good. Um, let's see, Michael, do you have some, you have some idea what you might wanna do? Um, yeah, so I think I'm gonna start off uh, with uh, uh, Aristotle's virtues and then talk about how uh, those uh, in relation to like uh, Christianity. Uh, and then after I've kind of pointed out like kind of the, the similarities and the, the, the positivities of the virtues. I think I'm gonna talk about like some of, some of the hypocrisy within Christianity 
uh, and uh, how that's led to uh, more like negative aspects. Um, and then I was kind of going to get into more of, I guess, I don't want to like define my worldview. At first, I was imagining more of like a, a, a Christian humanism. Um, but then when you mentioned the thing about not really like boxing yourself in, I was like, mm, maybe I won't give it a give it a label. Maybe I'll just uh, just take the, you know, take the points that I you know want. Um, and then um, and then I also really enjoyed like uh, the, the reading for class today about. Well, I mean, we obviously we we touched on like um essentially one of those bigger questions within like uh, Christianity is like why well not Christianity but uh, in religion in general it's like uh, uh, especially with like a monotheistic religion like why does God let bad things happen uh, and so I might um, I might touch on that as well uh, but I haven't I uh, I haven't um, thought through that just yet obviously because it really came up most prominently in today's class okay yeah, I do remember when I ran into a lot of obstacles and it was just because of my training and the way my mind works that I didn't blame God, but I just thought, wow, if I thought there was a God who really had it out for me, it would be really hard, you know, because that's just, um, that's like when a woman gets raped and she gets blamed, right? <laughs> it, it just seems so merciless but you know so many i don't know i mean again i i i like listening to the students explain how they think about those things because it it's interesting to me and it's often things that i hadn't thought of and so um i've learned i learn a lot from my students i really do um first of all i get ideas that i want but then just to learn about how, how other people think, that's a really important quality. You can't just say, I have empathy, you know, oh, I feel for other people, because you don't know what those people are, right? But when you start to understand how they think and why they think that way, then you really can have empathy and you really can appreciate people. So um, I feel like I have a much more sophisticated mind because I've been teaching in Arkansas for 25 years, whereas my children, they've all lived in bluer than blue places. And there's no way they thought Trump would get elected, not in a million years. And I told them, you're wrong. You know, I know how he can get elected. And so I, I just feel like I, I have a broader mind than they do. <laughs> uh, they have, but they have their own tasks. They have incredibly difficult jobs and they're all very humanistic jobs, right? One works on slave labor, international slave labor issues. One is a founder and co-director of inner city charter school. And one of them does um, business reporting that's not tainted by money. So, I mean, they're all doing good stuff and it's all difficult stuff. Um, and I'm just getting ideas all the time. So <laughs> I don't have the pressure on me, but I, it's, been, it's been really good to, to learn how other people think. And my children also admire me and that, that I, you know, that I read all this stuff and I help students with their ideas. And my children don't judge people either. They're just they just haven't had the kind of exposure that I've had. Um, so Trey, did you do you have any idea what you're going to write your final paper on? Uh, I guess I would kind of like throw in some of Aristotle's virtues because like I kind of believe in those a little bit. Like every single time I read over them, they just kind of make sense to me. Um, I don't know. I got a lot on my mind right now. I can't really like think about stuff right now, but uh, I'll probably get with you and maybe talk about some stuff. So the other thing that the students who got behind could do, as far as I'm concerned, is you could withdraw and then take the class again in the fall. Um, 
So I'm going to teach it jointly with the Asia University for Women. And so we would have breakout sessions where you're talking to women from Afghanistan, Bangladesh, from villages in Nepal. I mean, unbelievable. This one girl's dad is a faith healer, you know. <laughs> and, um, and that'll meet on Sunday nights and Tuesday nights, like from 9 to 1040 and probably won't conflict with too much stuff. Or when daylight savings ends, it's from eight to 940. So I, I'm afraid the fraternity and sorority things might get in the way, but if you wanna consider that as an option, um, because when you get so far behind, you have to do it sort of all on your own without a class. I mean, you have the videos, so whatever you wanna do is fine. Um, Anyway, I'm, uh, I'm perfectly willing to do the incompletes because I know, again, because of this shrinking middle class, that the students who, to, there's students who have advantages, not that many at Lyon, but then there's students who just have to work harder to get the same result. And so I'm, um, I'm completely open and I don't want students to think it's their fault or anything. It's all within this broader context. Again, Lion students, they aren't the spoiled brats of the world, but I did go to college with some of them because I went to these hoity-toity schools. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't have gotten this degree, right? I had to go to the, the fancy schools. But a lot of those kids uh, really, it ain't a level table, <laughs> but that's all right. You just have to keep working and I'll help you all I can. So it's been fun. It's been good guys. Um, and I'm going to have some office hours. What did I say? Um, 10 to 11. And then other than that, I wanna shut down and just read papers and grade. Uh, but if you want office hours at a different time, I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty flexible. I just am not gonna turn on the Zoom unless somebody emails me and asks for it, okay? I hope to see you around campus. I'm actually coming for a couple of weeks. Um, the week before classes to do some faculty workshop stuff and then the first week of classes. So, okay, take care. We'll see Thanks you, bye-bye, bye-bye.